Please take your seats. I'm very excited about this session. Um, I met Norma Gonzalez uh, last year at LRA, and um, we talked for a bit, and I said, would you come? Would you do this talk? And I was just thrilled that she said yes. So, yeah. <laughs> so I am really ready to begin. Um, I have a few brief announcements I'd like to share with you this afternoon. First, please turn off your cell phones or place them on vibrate. Second, immediately after, let's see, where we go here. Immediately after um, the plenary, we'll have an LRA town hall meeting from 6.15 to 7.15 in Salons D&E &E in the Costa del Sol ballroom. This is a time and place for addressing your questions and participating in a lively exchange among colleagues about literacy issues and LRA as an organization. This year's moderators are Dr. Lara Hansfield and Dr. Millie Gort. And there will be free popcorn and a cash bar. Um, there will also be a back channel. And this year, the back channel will include um, your signature, um, no pseudonym pseudonyms. So, um, we really would appreciate um, you coming. It's your form of voting at LRA. Later tonight, from 9 to midnight, um, we invite you also on behalf of the Field Council to Vital Issues, um, where you can meet in diversions in the clubhouse um, and be able to continue your conversations from today's events. Last night, I think there were nearly 200 people so if you're still looking for your people, that might be the place to be. Oh, this is scrolling, sorry. Okay. Excuse me just a minute, I wanna turn off the camera. I'm also very pleased to announce a gift from um, Trika Smith Burke, a former president of LRA and <laughs> beloved friend and colleague, who has um, created, and we have created at her request, a memorial fund in support of plenary speakers who are not members nor participants in the organization. Um, which will, and that those funds will contribute toward the Distinguished Scholar Lifetime Achievement Award to that recipient's um, honorarium or invited keynote speakers selected by the president-elect in planning the conference. We do spend some money on our speakers, I have to say, but we could certainly spend more. And Trika knew that. She knew that bringing outside voices, if you want to say that, voices from beyond the specific literacy curriculum um, or literacy um, research field um, that has been familiar to LRA will enable us to grow and, and really confront our assumptions. So she has donated um, uh, this, she has created, we've created this fund at her request. You'll be seeing at some point a link that will enable you to donate and add to that fund. So we thank Trika Smith Burke and her estate. Thank you. And now we turn to the Distinguished Scholar Lifetime Achievement Award presentation, followed by the Early Career Achievement Award presentation. I'd like to introduce Dr. Pat Edwards from Michigan State University and past president of LRA, who is the current chair of the Distinguished Lifetime Achievement Award. Good afternoon. The Distinguished Scholar Lifetime Achievement Award was first presented at the annual conference in 2001. The Distinguished Scholar Lifetime Achievement Award was initiated to recognize a distinguished scholar 
for a lifetime contribution that has had a significant impact on the field of literacy, theory, research, and practice. The award acknowledges an outstanding individual who has not been actively involved in LRA committee work, editorial work, or presentations, but whose lifetime work nevertheless has had a major influence on literacy, theory, research, and practice of the LRA membership. At this time, I would like to um, introduce the Distinguished Scholar Lifetime Achievement Award Committee members. If you're here in the audience, please stand as I call your name. Elizabeth Jagger, University of Arizona. Mary, Margaret Mary Sulentic, Louisiana State University. Jerry Capano, University of Pennsylvania. Judith Scott, University of California, Santa Cruz. Deborah Dillon, University of Minnesota. Barbara Laster, Townsend University. Ethel Lazar, St. Joseph University. Lisa Patel, Boston College. I'm proud to introduce to you the 2015 Distinguished Scholar Lifetime Achievement Award recipient, Dr. Gloria Latson Billings. The University of Wisconsin's Kilner Family Professor of Urban Education in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction. Dr. Latson Billings is known for her groundbreaking work in the fields of culturally relevant pedagogy and critical race theory. Dr. Latson Billings is perhaps best known for her book, The Dream Keepers, Success for Teachers of African American Children. This is a very significant text in the field of education. This text was first published in 1994 and continues to be used in teacher education programs around the country. She is an award-winning scholar. She served as president of the American Educational Research Association in 2005. During the 2005 AERA annual meeting in San Francisco, Dr. Latson Billings delivered her presidential address from the achievement gap to the education debt. Understanding achievement in U.S. schools in which she outlined what she called the education debt, highlighting the combination of historical, moral, social, political, and economic factors that have disproportionately affected African American, Latino, Asian, and non-white students. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Gloria Latson Billings. <laughs> Congratulations, Dr. Ladson Billings, and thank you for your inspiring address. Next, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Diane Lapp from San Diego State University and chair of the Early Career Achievement Award. There you go. Hello. Before I introduce the Early Career Achievement Award winner for 2015, I would like to mention that this yearly award was established in 1999, and it was begun to recognize the work of one LRA member who in the early part of his or her career has demonstrated outstanding commitment and accomplishment to the field of literacy through their research, their teaching, and their service. As a member of LRA for a few decades, I was thrilled to read the papers of this year's excellent nominees. Serving on this committee makes obvious to me and all the members 
that there are so many outstanding young scholars who continue to join LRA. The work of this committee was done by members who very courteously and rigorously scrutinized the materials of numerous excellent nominees. Let me introduce you to the committee members, and again, if you're here, please stand. Janet Gaffney, Sue, po Sue, po Sue Hopewell, Pamela Mason, Melissa Mosley Wetzel, Seth Parsons, and Shayla Rowe. Thank you for all the work that you did. I'd like to now introduce you to the 2015 awardee, Dr. Steve Amendum. Steve is an associate professor from the University of Delaware. Steve was nominated by Ellen McIntyre, who's the Dean of the College of Education at the University of North Carolina, and his nomination was confirmed by Sharon Walpole and Ralph Ferretti um, from the University of Delaware. Steve completed his PhD in literacy education in 2008 at the University of North Carolina, and he identifies as an apl applied researcher who strives to do work that matters for who else, for whom else, schools, teachers, and students. His work is focused on three areas that include literacy development and instruction for English language learners, literacy intervention for struggling learners, and classroom-based literacy practice that informs teachers. In 2009, Steve received the Promising Researcher Award from NCTE, and he also was a distinguished finalist for the IRA's Outstanding Dissertation Award. I hope someday you get to read his papers and the letters that were written about him because they were fabulous. Um, he's also, in these short years of his professional life, written many jury journal articles, book chapters, technical manuals and reports, conference presentations, and he's already amassed grants uh, up to $1.5 million. Here's what his colleagues said about him. They say that he has not only all of this excellent professionalism, but that he spends hours and hours with his students and that he makes his students feel that they are the most important part of his professional life. So it's my pleasure to, in, to give him this award and please welcome him with a big round of applause. I promise I won't take long. Um, Thank you, Diane, and to the whole committee. Um, I'm honored and humbled to accept this award from an organization that has meant so much to me professionally. This is my 11th LRA. Uh, I started in Miami 11 years ago, if anyone else did. Um, but I have to start by thanking my advisor, uh, my mentor, and my friend, Dr. Jill Fitzgerald. I don't know where she is. I know she's out there somewhere who modeled for me how to be an excellent teacher, uh, how, to be, uh, high how to do high quality research and gave her time and her expertise to me and to our other students. And I know that I wouldn't be standing up here if it weren't for her. Um, second, I wanna thank my colleagues at the University of Delaware um, and my former colleagues at NC State for creating productive environments where junior faculty could thrive. Um, my former department head, Ellen McIntyre, was very supportive of junior faculty. And finally, I just want to say again how honored I am to receive this award. Like Diane uh, said, I've seen the exceptional work that people are doing out there that are early in their careers like I am. And I'm humbled that the committee considered my work uh, along with those other folks that I've seen. And I'm truly honored to have been chosen. Thank you very much.
And now I'd like to introduce my good friend and colleague, Dr. Carmen Medina from Indiana University, who will introduce our plenary speaker. Thank you. Buenas tardes. En este año en que el ADI ha abierto nuevos espacios para apoyar nuestra comunidad bilingüe, in this year that LRA has opened up a new, new spaces to support our bilingual community, es un gran honor presentar a nuestra oradora en esta tarde. It is a great honor to present our speaker for this evening, Dr. Norma Gonzalez. Norma Gonzalez is a professor in the Department of Teaching, Learning, and Sociocultural Studies at the University of Arizona, where she also earned her PhD. Her passion for anthropology and her commitment towards the education of bilingual immigrant communities in the US-Mexico border serves as the foundations of her work. Her research interests include numerous areas, such as anthropology and education, applied anthropology, linguistic anthropology, language, socia language socialization, household ethnography, language processes in community, community school linkages, Latino populations, multicultural education, borderlands, women's narrative, transnationalism, and transnational literacies. She has numerous publications, including two books, Funds of Knowledge, Theorizing Practices in Households, Communities, and Classrooms, co-author with Luis Mo and Kathy Amanti, and she is author of the book, I Am My Language, Discourse of Women and Children in the Borderlands. She is also co-editor with Ellen McIntyre and Anne Roseberry of the book, Classroom Diversity, Connecting Curriculum to Students' Life. She has received important awards, such as the ARA Division G, Henry Treva Award for research in, the context, research in the transformation of the social context of education. She is also recipient of a Fulbright grant where she studied the transnational communicative patterns and practices among students attending border schools who previously attended, school, attended schools in the USA. Her collaborative work on funds of knowledge, in my opinion, has made multiple highly important contributions. In her research, she, uh, she has provided significant evidence of the effectiveness and positive consequences of reframing school learning in relation to families and communities' ways of knowing and the complex repertoires of cultural and linguistic resources children for minoritized, diasporic, and working class families engage with in their everyday lives. Her work her work also provides a new way of thinking about sociocultural theories and ethnography as research methods, but also as a pedagogical lens by engaging teachers in ethnographic practices and sociocultural approaches to learning to construct a better understanding of culturally diverse families' household knowledge and their cultural and linguistics access assets. Furthermore, this work translates into actual transformative curricular development as teachers construct new ways of thinking about classroom content knowledge, reframed through their analysis and interpretation of how people do things differently, linguistically, mathematically, or scientifically. This, this way, working at the intersection of research and pedagogy, teachers are able to actively reconfigure the role of families and communities' knowledge in school, seen beyond stereotypes and superficial understandings of how people live culturally. The normalized ways of doing schooling that privilege some and marginalize others get disrupted, opening new learning spaces for the benefit of all children. In addition to this work, she's an activist in the field of anthropology and education, particularly through her advocacy to develop a complex understanding of how to define and study transnational cultural practices, but also imposing new questions and alternative way to study traditionally marginalized communities. Furthermore, her long list of university, local, and national service speak of her, her active commitment and involvement in changing the ways we see and act upon, upon social injustices, particular, particularly those that take place around the U.S.-Mexico border. 
her colleagues describe her as a generous, giving, and a great collaborator. Es un gran placer ahora dejarlos con la doctora Norma, Gonzalo, Norma González. It is a great pleasure to leave you now with Dr. Norma González. Thank you, Carmen, for that lovely introduction. Um, and I thank Pat and Cecil for the um, invitation to speak here. I only have one question, and that is, how do you follow Gloria Ladson Billings? <laughs> um, I, as Pat mentioned, I'm somewhat of an outsider to LRA, but I really feel like an insider because uh, as I've attended the conference these last two years, so many of the themes resonate with work that I've done and that my colleagues have done. Um, I've been so excited to see all of the policy advocacy, everything that is going on here. And so I, I hope that um, we can continue what um, Janice talked about last night in terms of interdisciplinarity um, and that we can kind of transgress some of these disciplinary borders that I think kind of narrow us into thinking about literacy in, in only particular ways. Um, so what I'd like to kind of um, start with today, I'm going to be talking about the arising community flows. And I've got a little bit of a roadmap of where I'd like to go today. And there's three points that I want to elaborate. And um, luckily for me, a lot of these points have already been talked about both in the plenary and um, in the um, sessions that I've attended. So I, so I feel like there's a lot of energy around some of these. So the first point that I want to argue is that um, as literacy researchers and researchers in general, we should be thinking about theorizing practices rather than practicing theories. Not to say that the theory practice slash practice is a binary, but really rather an encounter within certain chains of meaning are connected and informed and inscribed within each other. So that's, that's the first thing. And, you know, again, Janice yesterday talked a lot about um, binaries and uh, rupturing these binaries. So I, I feel like um, this is a lot of continuity with that. The second point I want to argue is that the personal is not only political, as feminist researchers have been telling us for 50 years, but it's also theoretical. Um, if we want to speak of literacy as a social practice, we have to understand that social practices can be messy, that they can be complex, and they can be contradictory. As literacy researchers, our encounters with the sometimes messy practices of the personal invite us to engage with complexity. So rather than removing as many variables as possible from the equation to guarantee educational outcomes regardless of context, when we engage with complexity, we can really bring home that irreducible complexity that makes all contexts for teaching and learning hard to understand. The third point is that um, I'd like to think about research as responsibility. And again, I think Gloria beautifully elucidated that, that we need to think beyond our methodological toolkits and that we need to stake a claim as an epistemological stance that interrogates these sometimes naturalized hierarchies and commodifications um, that can define all of our research. So I want to start um, at a starting point with the 63rd LRA yearbook essay by Bloom, Averill, Hill, and Ryu. And this was entitled Ideologies and Their Consequences in Defining Literacies. And I found it a really interesting essay. And in this essay, they remarked that the term literacy was being widely used in a broad range of venues, and they enumerated an extensive list of different categories and types of literacy. So in their search, they found 66 uses of literacy, acknowledging that there were probably many more and that the term commonly was used to refer to knowledge or competence in some domain and not necessarily to uses of written language. In addition to the uses of literacy that have entered the common lexicon, like computer literacy, they cite a really diverse array of ways in which literacy is seen as a tool for understanding the natural and social world, such as vegetable literacy, which refers to knowledge of the uses of vegetables, and palpatory literacy as a skill in massage therapy. Um, given that the 66 literacies they uncovered were largely binaries of competencies, they ask if this is what literacy has become. 
And then they ask the more striking question, whether the term literacy has outlived its usefulness. So that's an interesting question. But to be honest, this questioning of the central hallmark of a field was not completely stunning to me, as it had been enacted in the discipline of anthropology with the deconstruction of the idea of culture. And I'd like to make some connections between that so that as we interrogate these grand totalizing theories, um, what, what can we learn from both of those? So in the field of anthropology, as we all know, this foundational touchstone has been the concept of culture. But what I want to trace is the lineage of the concept. And I will suggest that it is possible for concepts to lose their currency and usefulness. So just to give a really brief thumbnail sketch, and this is a really brief sketch because there is libraries written about the concept of culture. What I want to emphasize I that is not often mentioned in the, in the positioning of culture is that it emerged really as an antidote to the scientific racism of the time. And that it was really very much a fairly recent theoretical construct that emerged at the end of the 19th century. The prevailing dominant paradigm at the beginning of the 20th century in anthropology and in the social sciences in general assumed that human groups could be classified within an evolutionary perspective, following the accepted biological trajectory of ranking gradients of the most primitive to the most complex or civilized. But within this racialized hierarchy, it's not hard to imagine who and what groups occupied which rungs on this pseudoscientific ladder. And the evidence, quote, was measurement of skull size and cranial capacity and other anthropometric measures, as these were imputed as markers for intelligence. In what was not anthropology's finest hour, the anthropologist Brinton could claim, quote, measured by these criteria, the European or white race stands at the head of the list, the African or Negro at its foot. All parts of the body have been minutely scanned, measured, and weighed in order to erect a science of the comparative anatomy of the races. This pseudo-evolutionary ranking of racial hierarchies, with all that it implied, was not, however, unequivocally accepted. And here's, here's where the idea of culture comes in and is, is important for, for us. In the hands of one well-known anthropologist, Franz Boas, it was possible to think of the idea of culture as a powerful counter-discourse for explanatory significance outside of biogenetic and anthropometric measures, kind of a solvent that could dissolve some of this. Boas argues that something extrinsic to the human organism, aka culture, could account for human diversity in behavior and thought and in this way, he sought to transform the biogenetic argument of human development and behavior so that culture, not race or biology, could and did explain the vectors of diversity among Homo sapien. Through this powerful concept, a compelling argument could be made for the relativism of human societies, sometimes borrowing from each other and not marching along a unilateral evolutionary pathway. As a consequence, hierarchical racial classifications could not be scientifically defensible. Well, kind of remarkably, it actually caught on. Sometimes our theories do have power. The idea of culture began to expunge the pseudoscience embedded in racist assumptions of explaining diversity. However, and here is a relevance to thinking about the usefulness of the term literacy, about 30 years ago, within the field of anthropology, the central paradigm was shifting, and the concept of culture did not hold up well in considerations of essentializing discourses that exoticized the other. Further, where did the descriptive knowledge about what constituted a culture come from? Who described the elements of a culture? The textual production of cultural knowledge and its authorial legitimacy of the ethnographer were implicated in the, quote, crisis of representation, as the ethnographic method of detailing and writing culture began to be viewed as a scholarly artisanal construction of what was seen as an ethnographic fiction. Many anthropologists advocating writing against culture as the representation of the other and forced separation that inevitably conveyed a sense of hierarchy and the authority of the often invisible author. The anthropologist Abu Lugod could proclaim in 1991 that, quote, the notion of culture, especially as it functions to distinguish cultures, despite a long usefulness, may now have become something anthropologists would want to work against in their theories, their ethnographic practice, and their ethnographic writings. Not only were anthropologists urged to begin critiquing culture, writing against culture, but beyond culture, revisiting culture, putting culture in motion, 
the breakdown of culture, the demise of the culture concept, and the forgetting of culture, culture, it seemed, had outlived its theoretical usefulness. Culture had been viewed as reproduced across generations, implying static and fixed perspectives that sedimented groups of people in the public mind. Culture was bounded, fixed, equally shared, consistent, and stable within groups, and could be recognizable by a laundry list of cultural traits. More importantly, for our purposes in educational discourses, the tropes of bounded, internally homogeneous groups that uniformly shared a fixed and unchanging culture created the other through its regimenting lens. However, the concept of culture entered into educational discourses well before this critique, and we are very grateful that it did give rise to concepts like culturally relevant pedagogy and cultural modeling. Yet even with the acceptance and affirmation within education of culturally relevant teaching, within teacher education programs, culture often took on the work of homogenizing the lives of groups of students based on race and ethnicity, and in many ways became a proxy term for race and poverty. What had in its intellectual and theoretical genesis been a liberating construct censoring scientific reason began to be freighted with a political load of explaining educational disparities to the detriment of the poor and the marginalized. The culture of poverty took on a denigrating implications that continue to resonate to this day, as, as Gloria was explaining. Although critiques of the culture of poverty model have rebuked the policy enactments that embrace this concept, it continues to marshal currency in circulating discourses concerning the poor and the disenfranchised. In 1988, the critical race theorist Kimberlé Crenshaw could contend that racial inferiority, formally explicit, was now implicitly circulated through contemporary stereotypes based on notions of culture rather than genetics. And Gloria Ladson Billings could famously say, it is not the culture of poverty, but the poverty of culture. Culture beca became the roadblock that many students had to hurdle on their path to a quality education. What had once been welcomed as an emancipatory concept of culture to contest scientific racism had been appropriated to reinscribe ideological dominations. So as we wrap back around to the assertion by Bloom et al., culture had in these ways ceased to be a useful term and had been overtaken by naturalized hierarchies and commodifications that define the term. So this leads us to a dilemma. If we abandon a term that has been so central to our fields with no similarly powerful concept to replace it, what happens? We fought so hard to introduce the concept of culture into schools so that one size doesn't fit all and that instruction is not modeled just on dominant mainstream discourses so that culturally relevant, culturally responsive, culturally sustaining, cultural modeling pedagogies can be transformative for students. Yet the relevance of the central term is questioned, deconstructed, and abandoned because it can be hijacked in the service of political agendas and projects. How do we account for diversity without falling into essentializing discourses about students, communities, and families? In our funds of knowledge work, we never used the term culture, but instead focused on practices, on what people did and what they said about what they did in respectful, face-to-face -face engagements as we tried to document repositories of knowledge in an effort to subvert these deficit views of communities and households that are often encoded in discourses about the culture of poverty. The culture of poverty mindset, although discredited theoretically and methodologically, continues to hold sway not only in public discourses, but in ways that impact us as literacy researchers. Harmful myths about the lack of valuing education, lack of motivation, lack of parental involvement abound, and for-profit organizations offer frameworks for understanding poverty that are entrenched in deficit approaches. So of concern to us as literacy researchers in, in is recent research that has gained some traction in public media and public policy. Some common wisdom in literacy circles has been that a deficit in phonological processing is the most common cause of reading difficulty in students from middle class backgrounds, while a deficit in vocabulary knowledge is the most common cause of reading difficulty in students from low income backgrounds. Because many children in poverty are children of color, the slippages between poverty and race are often elided. Over 50 years ago, and I emphasize this because this is kind of old wine in new bottles, the ascendant view in the 60s that children in poverty enter school with linguistic deficits because of linguistically impoverished home environments is still the basis for many early childhood intervention programs. These programs may be well-intentioned, and indeed they are seeking the well-being of children, but they continue to promote assumptions about deprivation particularly linguistic deprivation. 
The most often cited research claims that there is a 30 million word gap between the number of words spoken to children between middle class families and families in poverty. Other research in this vein is one study that was featured on NPR's All Things Considered in April of this year, which claimed that Mexican American toddlers born in the US do not develop nearly as fast as white toddlers when it comes to language and preliteracy skills. Accompanying the NPR story was this image. So take a look at that for a minute. So for me, this image just really crystallizes all the deficit notions, notions about parenting into one neat package. It was quickly pulled from the NPR website, but it still appears on Angela Valenzuela's Texas Equity blog. But <laughs> take a look at the ideological and discursive formations that are there. There's a rich, cognitively expansive linguistic environment being promoted to the expressively attentive white infant. While the Latino baby is de depicted in linguistic isolation, not facing the mother or receiving verbal input from a mother, who although she is reading, the fact that it's a novella is really a proxy for the assumption about television telenovelas. And never mind the class distinctions about what kind of strollers they both had. <laughs> the fact that this made it onto the NPR website is indicative of how really widely entrenched and uninterrogated these uh, assumptive frameworks that view the language environments of households as not providing the correct number of words for children's academic success, and in the process indict their parents as unfit, because they don't know how to talk to their children. Now there's several counter discourses to the claim of the word gap, not the least of which is how do you count words if there are two or more languages involved, and most obviously the need to focus on the rich and varied linguistic resources that all children engage in with their home communities as their linguistic funds of knowledge. But I'd like to outline a couple of further arguments. One critical resource is the invited forum on bridging the language gap. It appeared in the Journal of Linguistic Anthropology, and I'd like to summarize some of these arguments. First of all, the work on the language socialization of children across the world challenges the long-standing claims of the universality of specific characteristics of language input to babies and young children. In fact, addressing the youngest children as conversational partners is pretty unusual if you take a global perspective. Middle-class Euro-American language socialization models are taken as normative as though they are biologically required and developmentally appropriate for all children. In contrast, the work of Barbara Rogoff and her colleagues and their framework of LOPI, L-O-P-I, learning by observing and pitching in, documents the rich learning environments, primarily in indigenous communities in Latin America, that doesn't rely on verbal input, relying instead on the incorporation of children in a range of endeavors in their families and communities as children are guided to learning to collaborate with consideration and responsibility through wide and keen attention. Further, the supposed significance of the number of words promotes a kind of wordism, as Susan Bloom refers to it, within which the insistence that the more words the better privileges only the referential function of language. However, language does much more than index or refer to objects in the environment, and children learn not only words, but how interaction happens at many levels, because language is really about relationships. How is one polite? Whom does one address? How does negotiation happen? When are we quiet? When are we still? How do we pray? How do we argue, defend oneself, joke, show affection, or index identities? By focusing only on the number of words directed to children, there's little attention to the multimodal and multisensory environment within which children learn, nor to the context of how, when, and by whom, and in what setting are words spoken. Anacelia Centella, for example, in her edited book, Building on Strength, documents the rich involvement by children in the social life of their communities, such as Mexican families playing loteria every week, Dominican families in New York City creating their own stories for children with special education needs, preschoolers imitating older siblings doing their homework, Bible study examining complex textual representations at home in Spanish, Scrabble fanatics, and collective efforts like playing games, singing songs, and reciting prayers and poems. This is not an impoverished linguistic environment, and the sociolinguistic context of language learning goes far beyond word counts. Similar research documents the textured and nuanced language environments of Native American children, yet in indigenous serving schools, as Teresa McCarty has documented, there are widespread federally imposed use of English reading regimes that are reductive and decontextualized, comprised of scripted vocabulary drills. Further, 
the 30 million word gap did not count words around and about the child, multi-party talk, or bystander talk, language patterns that, when taken into account, can make the so-called gap disappear. So I'd like to pick up on some of the points that uh, Gloria has just so beautifully um, conveyed to us by exploring the dimensions of these communicative flows within communities. Um, and we can see the richness in the examples that she just gave us, how students just celebrate and craft and transform these language and literacy practices. But in order to excavate these practices and flows, we need to adopt a critical language awareness that makes visible the range of varieties and variations of language that are often flattened in school curricula and by efforts to conform to academic varieties of language. And I do refer to these as varieties of English, not dialects, which implies within itself a deviation from the norm. These are varieties of English, rule governed with internal grammatical consistency and systematicity. So to illustrate some of these flows, I'd like to give two exciting examples of work in this area, and Gloria has already given exciting examples um, and has already cited H. Sami Ali. But what part of the work that Sami does is, um, in his classes, um, also does critical hip-hop language pedagogies, which he locates within a vision for critical reflexive language pedagogies and a call to mobilize a full range of language, social, and cultural theory to produce these consciousness-raising pedagogies. And these approaches include the Real Talk Project, Language in My Life Project, hip hopography, the ethnography of hip-hop culture and communication, and linguistic profiling in the classroom. These are compelling examples of theorizing practices and communicative flows that foreground concrete instances of pedagogical approaches that further what Chris Gutierrez has referred to as socio-critical literacies, students as they research their own reality. Juan Guerra, in his uh, keynote to LRA in 2011, coined the term language in stasis, referring to language as an entity that has become fossilized over time into a standardized variant that everyone is expected to emulate. He argued that dismissing the linguistic and cultural repertoires of practice that students bring with them to the classroom as soon as they have served a transitional purpose, by which he means moving them into standard academic English, is engaging in a modern day form of code segregation. Similarly, Alim argues that youth cultural and linguistic practices are of value in their own right and should be creatively foregrounded rather than merely viewed as resources to take students from where they are to some presumably better place. As necessary as it is to value these in their own right, we can also expand these repertoires into academic settings. One example of learning that is useful beyond the classroom is the work from the work of Marjorie Orellana, Ramon Martinez, Mariana Pacheco, and Paula Cabroni whose work in the project with a very clever but insightful title, Found in Translation, which engages Latina and Latino youth to examine their own language practices for the purpose of lever leveraging ex and expound expanding what might count as language for learning in school and beyond. The foundational body of work by Marjorie Orellana highlights the often overlooked linguistic practices of many bilingual youth as they engage in language brokering, interpreting, and translating in a number of formal and informal settings. Taken to the next level, a research team designed activities around these community practices in the cultural modeling tradition as developed by Carol Lee. Further work by Danny Martinez and Elizabeth Montaño found that as students took translation beyond the literate purposes of translation, they came to understand their interpretation as part of a larger set of skills that were meaningful for academic purposes, but also for navigating diverse communities and repertoires. And by the way, they're presenting tomorrow, so if you'd like to attend their session, it would can expand on that. But in order for these pedagogies to be effective though, we have to develop a critical language awareness of our own assumptions about language as well as about the aims of language and literacy in schools, for these are examples of deeper learning beyond the common core. One concern in the shift to common core standards is that the weight of citing specific textual evidence when writing to support conclusions drawn from the text can dilute and diminish the power and the joy of reading beyond citing evidence. Drawing on the linguistic repertoires of students' lives makes evidence come alive as they read texts that draw on multiple semiotic and multimodal expressions. These communicative flows are the real social practices upon which students use and transform literacy. And they themselves can become literacy researchers, excavating forms, genres, and modes of digital literacies in which they are the experts. 
we as educators can become co-constructors, learners among learners, as students theorize their own practices. But on another level, we also need to interrogate further conventions about language to uncover these linguistic flows on multiple planes, including the following assumptions. The first is the idea of monolingualism as the norm. Although much is said in public discourse about the benefits of speaking, reading, and writing more than one language, the reality is that monolingual norms remain as the invariant standard that presupposes monolingualism to be the unmarked, unexamined category. The field of second language acquisition has recently examined the multilingual turn and has traced the efforts of the mon monolingual bias in ignoring existing bi and multilingual repertoires and competencies, as well as fluid and overlapping communicative practices. For example, discussions of dynamic bilingualism and translanguaging belie a strikingly different basis for analyzing language learning that transcend monolingual norms. This claim has conspicuous consequences for thinking about literacy as a social practice. First of all, it problematizes the whole L1, L2 distinction itself, confronting the sequ sequential addition of a second language rather than, as is far more common, the simultaneous multiple language learning context evident in multilingual environments. In this sense, many of our students are not English learners, but rather multi-competent English users, utilizing multiple language and literacy competencies simultaneously. Secondly, it interrogates the native speaker slash writer competence to be a uniform benchmark in relation to second language learning. Lourdes Ortega argues that the term native speaker is used to denote a language user who not only has had exposure to the language by birth, but who has also had a monolingual upbringing. This archetypal native language user is imagined to possess a superior kind of competence, one whose purity proves itself in the absence of detectable traces of any other language. Learning to function in one language only is understood as a default and subsequently subordinates bilingualism and multilingualism as a less natural form of knowing, doing, and learning language than monolingualism. A second assumption that critical language awareness can uncover is the nature of language and languages themselves. Maconi and Pennecook, in their work on disinventing and reconstituting languages, argue that languages themselves are inventions, that is, social constructions. So that can be a jarring assertion if we work in language and literacy. What is real? The analogy that they present is the notion of time. The rotation of the Earth on its axis is a natural phenomenon, but the measurement of time is an artifact, a convention. When they argue that languages are constructed, they go beyond linguistic criteria sufficient to establish the existence of a language, but to identify the social and semiotic processes that led to their construction. So for example, within the colonial project and the colonial governance, languages were decreed into existence because they needed identification, codification, and control. They needed to be invented. I raise this issue here because there are very real material implications to thinking of languages as dis discrete, pre-existing entities and a corollary implication that language, race, and place were historically constructed as indivisible and kind of laminated onto each other. However, to claim that languages were invented can lead us to a very slippery slope in which concepts such as multilingualism, additive bilingualism, and code switching can lose their traction. My point here is to open the possibilities about thinking about communicative practices that are found in communities, not in opposition to what is referred to academic language or standard English, but as a range of the multiple and multimodal semiotic systems and resources that flow in and through communities. From the standpoint of theorizing communicative flows within communities, this stance is critical. Rather than assuming languages as discrete entities, bounded and unified, as we now engage with super diversity, New ways of highlighting the permeable boundaries of language include translanguaging, code meshing, contemporary urban vernaculars, flexible bilingualism, metrolingualism, dynamically lingual education. A um, little bit of a sidebar, one really stunning and evocative example of the invention of language, um, as well as of the ability of even very young children to cross linguistic borders is the unique case of Kisisi, our language, written by my colleague Perry Gilmore who traces the unexpected invention of a private language between two five-year-olds, her own son, Colin, and Sadiki, a Samburu speaker, as they formed a deep and abiding friendship in 1970s Kenya.
by bringing to bear the full range of their linguistic, metapragmatic, syntactic, and semiotic knowledge, these two five-year-olds generatively created a language to construct new identities and resist, transgress, and transform the marked post-colonial borders and harsh inequities and language ideologies of their socio-political context. Now, let I'm going to make a claim here that lest we assume that concepts such as translanguaging and code meshing are only for those whose linguistic repertoires include more than one language, I would like to say that all of us can be translingual and that this is a skill set that we must cultivate in all of our students, whatever their language background. Aleem and Smitherman, in their provocative book, Articulate While Black, argue that the shifting demographics in the U.S. have produced altered relationships between dominant American English and power. They argue that during the 2012 presidential election, for example, Barack Obama's linguistic repertoires, fluent in African American language, as well as some Spanish, was a marked contrast to Mitt Romney's inability to shift between speech styles and was a prime example of how monolingualism can act as a deficit in certain contexts. Further, there is an argument that we have traditionally taught youth of color and their teachers that the only codes of power are dominant or standard American English. Ironically, there is accumulating evidence that this stance may be outmoded and that in our increasingly diverse society, it might actually reduce access. So Django Paris and Samuel Lim claim that, quote, to offer youth full access to power then, we must understand that power is now based in part on one's ability to communicate effectively to more than standard English monolingual monoculturals who are becoming a shrinking share of the U.S. population. My assertion about translanguaging as an avenue for all students is based partly on what G terms social languages. As we all move across multiple domains of our lives, G's claim is that there is no such thing as decontextualized language and that rather than learning English or literacy in general, learning is, a, is about specific social languages tied to specific communicative tasks and functions. These tasks and functions are tied to specific discourse communities and social practice. In this sense, we can argue that we are also all English learners, always working to learn and use new forms, genres, and registers for new contexts. So how can we think about translanguaging and translingualism in this broader sense? I believe that one way we can address and, and how to enhance our students' multidiscursive capabilities is to theorize transnational literacies in open and engaging ways that are accessible to all students, not only those with multilingual or transnational experiences. So for example, I taught a class on transnational literacies last year, and I'd like to share what I learned from my students. They say that the teacher always learns twice, and I had to position myself as a learner as we explored elements of how transnational literacies in what Lamb and Warner describe as the mobility of people, languages, texts, and practices in contexts of movement and migration. We explored the emerging and growing body of literature that locates the social fields within which literacies and transnational spaces intersect and inform communicative practices. We looked at transnational media and digital communication and unpacked how the mobilities of texts enhanced our understanding of textual production. We explored Bizet's Carmen in a Senegalese context, we explored Japanese hip hop and Chinese context for Phantom of the Opera. Similar work by Suresh Kanagaraja on literacy as translingual practice includes translingual practices in Kenyan hip hop, the creolization of Asian American rhetoric, and exercises for moving out of the monolingual comfort zone. Although many of the students in this class came from multiple language backgrounds, not all of them did, yet they were all able to participate in access through multimedia the power of the changing landscape of mo mobile textual formations. By recruiting all of our multiple literate and languaging resources, we were able to come to a critical language and literacy awareness through encounters with transnational literacies and texts. So I'd like to cite two examples of other ways that students can examine community literacy practices that flow in their own backyard. First of all, I draw on the work of Luz Murillo, uh, who's sitting up here, who inspires her pre-service teachers in a borderlands context to develop ethnographic eyes as they discover the fluid linguistic landscapes that surround neighborhoods as she sends them out to explore flea markets, local small businesses, and musical groups. And here you see some of the images that they captured. 
these teacher candidates are thus exposed to thinking about languaging resources that come into contact and use and represent a negotiation of diverse linguistic resources for situated constructions of meaning. These are examples of how students themselves can explore the flows through community and acknowledge that the alignment of words with other symbol systems and contexts. A second powerful example of translanguaging in school contexts is the Puente de Osho Trilingual Immersion School in Northern Arizona, where students are exposed to three languages, Navajo, English, and Spanish, as indicated by the translingual name of the school, Puente, or bridge in Spanish, and Osho, beauty, peace, harmony in Navajo. A translingual language can also draw out the playful and generative use of words, as in this slide. What if soy milk is just regular milk <laughs> introducing itself in Spanish? <laughs> Think, <laughs> Think of all you had to know to understand that. But it does ground the multiple modalities and social and material contexts of communication. So these are concrete avenues for languaging, and I do use this as a verb, and translanguaging experiences that are not restricted to predefined meanings of individual languages, but merge and hybridize language resources in situated interactions for new meanings. I echo Tanagaraja, who claims that the tra term translingual enables us to treat cross-language interactions and contact relationships as fundamental to all acts of communication and relevant for all of us. In this sense, this shift in literacy is not relevant for traditionally multilingual student subjects alone, but for native, quote, speakers of English and monolinguals as well. And we must recognize that what we treat as standard English or monolingual texts are themselves hybrid. So to further illustrate some of these flows, I'd like to turn to some data from work I have done, um, and this was on, on the Fulbright that um, Carmen mentioned, um, with transnational movements that flow in different directions. Children with schooling experiences in the United States who have moved back to Mexico. In our study, my co-author, Yamilet Martinez, and I complicate the reversal of the traditional paradigms of sending and receiving communities, as the United States is a sending community and Mexico is a receiving community. This is a phenomenon that is understudied and has much to teach us about issues concerning language and literacy. As these children return, sometimes unexpectedly, as English speakers, readers, and writers to a homeland that is not really home to them. According to estimates, there are at least half a million, uh, half a million students in Mexico who have had schooling in the US. We conducted our study in Sonora, the neighboring state to Arizona, in 2013, and a few brief bullet points of our findings include that the students had varying levels of both English and Spanish. Half of them indicated that they used English in their interactions with older siblings. Usually the older siblings had schooling also. And another half stated that they did not use it regularly or only on sporadic occasions of phone calls and visits to the US. Another interesting thing was that the majority reported very positive experiences in their school in the US. Many of them recalled their U.S. teachers who took a special interest in them and spoke to them in Spanish. And I think this is really um, indicative of how we need to think of these very long-term consequences of the schooling context of kids, because kids grow up and they remember. Um, so I want to focus on one case study student, Hugo. And he serves as an illustration of how multiple literacies can move across time and space and how it is possible to examine the affordances that mobilize knowledge and to shed light on the complexities of students' negotiation of multiple languages and literacies in these transnational social fields. Work on the multilingual and multimodal literacies and literacy practices that trans migrants bring with them and those they develop in new contexts help us to focus on the flows of information, resources, and practices across multiple geographies of learning, to lear use Leander et al.'s term. Ugo's use of digital tools can be envisioned not as a discrete skill or a particular type of literacy, but rather as a way that students can become producers of spaces in processes of literate production, rather than solely consumers of media. His transnational communicative practices illustrate the affordances of overlapping social, digital, and transnational networks and how new media present youth with the possibility of tools that support the flows of social practices and relationships across proximal and distal networks and spaces. So this particular student was born in the United States and he attended preschool and first grade in Arizona. His family then returned to Mexico 
And when we interviewed him, he was in the seventh grade. So a full six years had gone by since his return. In his own words, he describes how he transcends the space of the school in order to maintain transnational contacts that stem from his identification within peer and gaming networks. And he maintains his English through these transnational ties. He then elaborates his continued use of English through multimodal and digital technologies. And I'm keeping the original Spanish interview transcript in order to keep with the tenor of transnational literacies and translanguaging, and also with um, program chair Pat and Cecil's emphasis on multilingual modes of presentation. I'm going to talk through what the transcripts say, but I think we can all mobilize our translanguaging skills to try to make sense of the transcript. So he says here that he still uses English, although not with his parents. His online gaming communities is where he connects with other Minecraft and Happy Wars players, and they speak in English about their lives and schools. As he interacts with both local and distant others in the US and Canada, he has afforded the opportunity to diversify his communicative practices and to reflect on the dissimilar context of the lives of his fellow players, as they, and they similarly engage with his repertoire. These dispositions and networking sites and online interactions are key sites for negotiating ling language diversity effectively. He metapragmatically details his translanguaging experiences as he describes how he conducts searches in YouTube in both English and Spanish on how to create a profile for Xbox, filling in gaps as he shuttled between the two searches. He became a conscious creator and producer of his own competencies that move across multiple contexts and engage the social practices of literacy within network publics spanning digital and out of school domains. He continues to use these translanguaging strategies in other domains as he intentionally watches television in English, relying on technological capabilities that allow him to shift between languages. He describes how through his manipulation of cable channels, he is able to receive television channels in multiple languages and makes it a point to watch Adventure Time, Amazing World of Gumball in English, as well as sports channels, especially American football. Now we need to look at why this student is intentionally maintaining his English skills and how he views his future. Literacy as a social practice must be understood with particular goals that align with the identities and subjectivities of youth. This student has envisioned a future for himself that also spans boundaries, and his future subjectivity is written in English. In this case, Ugo's future imaginary is narrated through his redrawing of his social spaces, and he intentionally crafts his future identity as a US student. Because he is a US citizen, he is sure that he will one day return to the United States, and he has already made plans to attend and graduate from an Arizona high school so that he can attend a US university. In fact, 100% of all the students we interviewed who were born in the US and were US citizens all indicated that they would someday return to study or live in the US. Ugo is making full use of his multi-competencies, mobilizing his resources both in his current space and his imagined future. So my uptake of G's assertions about social languages is that by learning the repertoires of practice of, for example, gaming communities or the social language of a faith community, we translanguage across the ecologies of our everyday practice through the full and ample use of our linguistic and literate repertoires. In that sense, we are all translingual. If we think of moving across language and literacy borders as spaces for pedagogical potential, we can underscore that learning is about engagement with diverse voices and conceptualizations, expanding students' repertoires of practice by mobilizing knowledge across social fields can redefine learning as nonlinear, and diversity adds to the heterogeneous pool of available resources. Students can develop a translingual awareness that perceives languages as plural, as flu fluid, as diverse, and that this awareness can help students succeed outside of monolingual norms. So I want to pause here for a moment, because here we are. Culture is seen as an essentialization, kind of a throwback to racial hierarchies. Language is invented. Communities are crisscrossed by these global transnational flows, and nothing seems to stay still very long, at least not long enough to study it. And monolingual standard academic English is not the only access to power. So what are we supposed to do? The post-structural turn in many of our fields have produced incisive critiques of contingent ways of positioning knowledge, and we have disinvented and deconstructed large meta-narratives about how we understand the world. 
but have we reconceptualized, reconstituted, and re-envisioned the deconstructed fragments? Not so much. So when everything is in question, when the ground is shifting, when ha we have been untethered from our academic moorings, when uncertainty and doubt infiltrate our knowledge production, what do we do? I think we need to go back to what we do know, what we are sure of, what we can testify has meaning. And as a literacy research community, I think we can agree on at least one thing, and that is the power of story. And I think throughout this conference, we have seen the power of story told in many different venues. We can't go wrong with telling a story. Stories are not just stories, though, because um, as I mentioned in the beginning, the personal is not only political, it is also theoretical. When we theorize practice, we are making sense through stories, and our stories are our theories. As, racial, as critical race theory theorists affirm. Our standpoint epistemologies are built and constructed around where we stand and the stories of what led us to this standpoint. So I'd like to tell you a few stories that when we scratch the surface, help us to understand that we don't practice theories, we practice stories. So I'd like to blur some genres here, code meshing academic conference talks with storytelling. So the first story is personal and is a snippet of an interview I did with my grandmother, my father's mother, Soledad Benguechea Paul, back in 1980 when she was 80 years old. Last year in the Oscar Kazi address, yet a good man talked about using old data. Well, this is really old data, um, 25 years old, but it's recast from the personal to the theoretical. In this small fragment of conversation, she's talking about her life in Arizona circa around 1910 four years after they had crossed the border from Chihuahua, Mexico. She, she had explained how her uncle came across to work in the copper mines and had sent for his family to join him. Her mother, my great-grandmother, went to work as a housekeeper and a child care provider for a rancher in Calvin, Arizona, John Zellweger. Here she explains how after his first wife, who was German, had passed away, he sent for her sister. Pero no quería esposa de aquí. He'd made a trip to Germany to bring the other sister. Doña Sofia. She was the one who bought me my prayer book when I made my first communion. Era como familia y hablaba español. Muy potrero, pero hablaba español. Y muy buenos eran con mi mamá. One time, mi mamá nos platicó y me dijo mi tía, si otra gente me lo platicara, no lo iba a creer, pero viniendo de ti, sí lo creo. She used to go because she loved the garden that she had, and one time she was putting something on the stove, and she went out to the yard to water, and then... When she was watering, people passed by, and she stopped to, you know, visit with everyone, talking with everyone. She lost track of time. When she went in, she saw a flame coming up through the bottom of the dish, and everything was burned, and the bottom of the dish was burned. Anybody else would have fired at her. And then my grandmother, in her best German-inflected Spanish, said, Conrada, tienes que tener más cuidado. Their son, John Boy, no me quería a mí. He was jealous. My mother used to take care of him when he was a baby. That's when she went to go live in Calvin, Arizona, because John y su esposa tenían un big ranch allá y se fueron a vivir allá, and they didn't want any stranger to take care of John Boy. Y cuando mi mamá me escribía, le decía, ¿a quién me estás escribiendo? A la esa soledad. He never liked me. He was jealous. Well, two points to make here. First of all, the translanguaging here is evidence of how deeply embedded translanguaging is in the interstices of languages and, and borders. Born in Mexico in, the in 1900, but schooled here, my grandmother's communicative practice at this point in her life, when she was 80 years old, reflected not deficiency, but language virtuosity and a lifetime of multiple language repertoires. She was perfectly proficient in both languages, yet the languages were so intimately intertwined that any boundary making would dilute the power of the utterances. Another point is that even German immigrants to the Southwest region learned Spanish the language of ranching, of local ecologies, of mining, and of commerce, evidenced by the Spanish of both Doña Sofia and their son, John Boy. Using the full range of their linguistic resources was an accepted social practice in Arizona, imagine that, in 1910, two years before it became a state, belying the current English-only monoglossic ideologies of monolingualism and underscoring again how language ideologies index situated political context. Yeah, I thought you would appreciate the <laughs> image about the purity of our language. <laughs> In 1910, Arizona, 
Ranchers, miners, and even domestic workers deployed the full range of their languaging resources in order to carve out their survival in the arid and rugged terrain where all resources were precious knowledge. The second story I want to tell is more poignant. In 1950, a troop of mostly untrained, young, and inexperienced Tucsonenses, young men mostly from the barrios, um, left the Tucson train station in the late afternoon of July 31st, 1950 for the Korean conflict. These mostly teenage boots were largely Mexican-American and had approximately only two or three weeks of training. And they made the amphibious landing at Incheon, fought in the frozen hills and mountains of North Korea. They came to be known as the E Company Marines and are memorialized in a local monument and reunions commemorating their service. Among the 12 that did not return is my uncle, my mother's older brother, Jesus R. Carrasco, killed in action in September of 1950. The Memorial Day Parade in Tucson the May following his death was to be impressive, commemorating those who had served and died. But somehow my mother found out that the parade organizers had refused to let a Mexican-American carry the American flag in the parade that was to honor the fallen. Shocked and outraged, and she wielded the only weapon she had, a weapon of literacy. Although by nature not one to be outspoken, she composed and wrote a petition and went door to door, barely able to choke out the words, my brother was good enough to die for this country, but we're not good enough to carry the flag. Whether because of her efforts or the realization of the injustice of the proclamation, the ban was lifted. So our stories here can apprehend literacy as a practice that resisted, repelled, and talked back to unfairness. These are literacies as social practices, which should be a starting point, not an end point. As Gregorio Hernández Zamora argues in his text on decolonizing literacy, literacy should be understood as a fundamental practice of voice and a tool for self-authoring one's place in the world. Literate people, he claims, are not those who decode texts, but those who use text to decode the world and speak for themselves. Reading the world through the word is more important than reading the word. Freire's famous dic dictum in its original Portuguese, a leitura do mundo presege a leitura da palavra, the reading of the world precedes the reading of the word. It's a little bit different in English. Reading the world allows us to see the incident that I just described, not just as a story, but is woven into a larger narrative where occurrences cannot be understood synchronically without access to the diachronic, since the larger historical narrative and social memory, if it is forgotten, begets historical illiteracy. We read not only the lines, but between the lines and beyond the lines. So when Donald Trump, you didn't think I was gonna <laughs> not mention him, right? How could I not? When Donald Trump bullies Jorge Ramos into, quote, going back to Univision, it is not a story of a journalist who oversteps into advocacy. Latinos read, decode the world through a narrative of illegitimacy, of being unauthorized, of not belonging, no matter the credentials, no matter the juridical authorization, no matter the permanence of place or history. And these are the stories that our Latino children have woven into their sense of placemaking, their sense of belonging, not belonging, and their sense of citizenship, not citizenship. And these stories cannot be relegated to the incidental or the anecdotal. This is the textual evidence that they read and they draw inferences from the evidence of the text that is their everyday lived experiences. What else can be read as evidence of theorizing practices and theorizing the lives of st and stories of our students? Two small little vignettes that come from research that my colleague Nina Rabin and Mary Carol Combs and I undertook on the 25th anniversary of Playa Vido. We interviewed teachers and administrators about the impact of undocumented students in their schools, and through our interviews with them emerged these two stories that are emblematic of the lives of our students after their bus ride home. So this is the first one. This is a, an elementary school teacher, uh, first grade teacher. And part of her interview, she says this. When he came back, first he told me he was born in Mexicali. And so then he comes back the next day and he says, no, no, my mom said to tell you I was born in Tucson. Then the next day he comes back and he's like whispered, miss, miss, no es cierto. I was born in Mexicali. My mom doesn't want you to know. So this one declaration by a first grade student in just a few sentences frames the inability to voice that which cannot be told. This child must decide whether he betrays his family or betrays his teacher, a heart-wrenching dilemma for a six-year-old, and yet a dilemma that silences many children of many backgrounds 
for a multitude of reasons. Because to speak the unspeakable is to invoke the gaze of the outside. In this case, within a heightened discourse surrounding immigration, many students must live invisibly, and even as children must look over their shoulder, sometimes preferring not to go on field trips because of detention points outside of the city. Any chance encounter with any state or legal institution, even a traffic ticket, may have unexpected and negative consequences. As a result, many undocumented students do not experience schools as a place where status distinctions really are irrelevant. The second quote. Una prima de mi tía nos dijo si algún día pasa eso, que se llevan a su mamá, véngase a mi casa y yo los cuido hasta que terminen su escuela. A cousin of my aunt told us that if one day something happens, and by what she means by what something happens, is a, a workplace raid, and they take away your mother, come to my house and I'll take care of you until you graduate from high school. So these are contingency plans that students have to make in, in case that, uh, of these occurrences. But this is the specter that hangs over children and young people in our schools. What will happen if one day I come home and my parents are gone? For the children of the undocumented, the threat of a parent's sudden disappearance is an unconscionable everyday reality. Unfortunately, from their standpoint epistemologies, these are not idle questions. They reflect the very real possibilities that surround them and what they hear in stories told and retold to different audiences. What can we learn from these stories of our students? Anti-immigrant measures that penalize students beg the question, can teachers realistically preach education to students as a way to better their lives when even community college, which could be an option, would mean out-of-state tuition and no financial aid for the undocumented person? Why bother with AP courses in college preparation? So I'd like to take this up here to ask a fundamental question. What does it mean to really operate from an assets-based model when the lives of our children are complex? When crossing a border is fought, fraught with danger and possibly death. When looking for assets and strength, do we sometimes strip away the socio-political context that argu arguably impact all knowledge production and learning? As Pat and Cecil has so eloquently written, students with complex social histories must be recognized for their insights about equity and justice. However, the point here is that we cannot understand our students nor give them voice if the reality of their lives is invisibilized or erased. So we have to make visible the invisible. But how do we as educators give voice to those things that are too difficult to name, that which must remain invisible? Because to speak must be to speak from a place where sorrow and pain come together to frame literate expressions. One such expression is found in this art poem by an unknown, unaccompanied child, written prior to his deportation from custody, who recruits his translingual and literary resources in the context of repatriation and loss. So as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, there are several ways in which Riga's researchers can address the struggles of people to engage with issues that confront the communities in which we work and in which we teach. Terry Eagleton, the critical theorist, reminds us as scholars, that there is nothing academic about these struggles, and we forget that at our own cost. One way to claim literacy research as a principled epistemological stance is to confront and take responsibility for the real-life effects of literacy theorizing and the practicing of our theories. We must challenge the analyses, any analyses, that disadvantage youth from non-dominant populations by deconstructing the categories that devalue communities and educational possibilities. Within this stance, we interrogate in whose interest is research undertaken and how can policy be research driven in a way that is respectful of and responsive to communities. To keep our insights only within the domain of theory and not how that theory is practiced can allow the reproduction of symbolic violence. And I think this echoes what Gloria was saying. So for this reason, I'm very cautious when I talk about the deconstruction about of the culture concept because we don't want to return to a day when learning is only a cognitive phenomena and when one size fits all. By overemphasizing the fluidity of intercultural flows of knowledge, we can unintentionally expunge the historicized struggles of a people. Similarly, I am very cautious when I say that languages are not bounded and autonomous because such a view of language undercurds much of bilingual education that argues that skills acquired in the first language transfer to the second language. If we banish these theoretical foundations, what similarly powerful constructs can we marshal to politically and ideologically foreground the multi-competencies of our students? We can recast the role of literacy research as a technology of knowledge and power 
whose method is itself a knowledge producing mechanism as a critical perspective can uncover and contest the old narratives that cycle through even the newest stories. But we can write new narratives. The strength of literacy research, the focus on textual production, framed by macroeconomic, social, and political forces, and the analysis of textual embeddedness and larger structures of power is a unique contribution. But in some ways, it's also our weakness. In comparison with the growing tendency to understand and generalize educational processes and success through broad comparative and statistical terms, literacy research should insist on the importance of context, history, and particularity. We underscore our strength to give voice to those who inhabit illegible or ambiguous spaces, as well as a critical literacy that underlies a moral discourse around imaginaries from the margins. So if we live in an age of super diversity, then we must find a super abundance of avenues to engage with stories across unbounded learning contexts in community and contest static views of literacies, language, and learning. And we can and we will continue to be inspired by the theme of this conference in enabling our imagination in pursuit of equity in literacy. Muchas gracias. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Gracias. <laughs> Did I go way over? <laughs> no, you did not. We needed that every was, single that word. That's what I was afraid of. <laughs> Thank you for your brilliance. Yeah, okay. And you've invited us to practice our stories. Let's do this in the town hall meeting, in vital issues, and throughout the rest of the conference. Thank you, Marianne. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll adjourn now to the Costa del Sol Ballroom, um, Salons D&E. See you there. <laughs>